He is risen. He is risen indeed. Look, 60% of us, we were there. Thank you so much. Happy Easter. Uh, God bless you. You may have a seat. Great to be with you on this Easter Sunday. Listen, uh, I was reflecting this week on, on Easter Sunday and just what it means to me personally. And honestly, Easter Sunday could be my favorite Sunday of the entire year. And if you call yourself a regular here at our church, then you know most of the time I preach in a hoodie and maybe jeans, but you know, you get, you get a little more on Easter, right? I like to dress up a little bit on Easter and looking out, some of you do too, because it's a special day, right? And so Easter for our family, it also means gathering around food. Anyone else? Anyone else? You, you got something planned later? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it means a lot of family time. It means that my kids just get a lot of chocolate eggs and neglect from me because I'm tired, you know? And that's just Easter in the pastor's house, sorry. But Easter, it just means so much. Like here in Louisville, you have a couple of Easter parades and that's fun. Plenty of Easter egg hunts. And you know, you gotta get to a church on Easter. You gotta post your drip so everyone sees it. And so yes, Christ has risen and so have my Doc Martens. Hashtag Easter, right? Now, what I'm trying to say, Easter's a lot, right? Right? Easter is a lot. So no wonder some of us need 51 weeks off from church after Easter. It is such a big commitment, you know? We just need to take a break. But I'm glad you're here. I'm Pastor Kevin. I'm the lead pastor here at Rock Vineyard Church. And I want to take just a few minutes to talk about the most powerful, the most powerful force in the universe. And I think we've all experienced, whether you say, I have faith, I have some-ish faith, or I have no faith at all. Regardless of it all, I wanna talk about love because love changes everything. And we are all here today because of it. Don't think about it too hard because it's church, but you're all here because of love. And so if, if, if you're mad about that, blame love because love causes all sorts of nervousness on first dates, right? Love causes butterflies on third dates, right? Love really causes us to make overwhelming commitments in front of family and friends. The power of love can literally do anything. It can literally raise the dead. And the highest expression of love is sacrifice. When was the last time that you saw a movie where someone made the ultimate sacrifice and you were actually moved by it. I know it's been three years, but is it still too soon to talk about Iron Man? Is that like, am I spoiling anything for you if I talk about that, right? Love's, the, the highest expression of love is sacrifice. Love is, is beautiful and it makes your heart grow and feel things you could never imagine. And love will also cause such deep grief and pain because nothing breaks your heart like love does. And so we all have a deep desire to love, to know love, and to be loved. And boy, do I have a story for you today about love. We are going to look at an element of the Easter story, Easter morning, actually. And we're going to do so through the perspective of one man in particular. Just so you know, so we're all on the same page, there are a few accounts of Jesus' life and his ministry. And we're going to look at, at one of those from one of his disciples who actually never names himself. This disciple names other people when they are involved. You know, when Peter is saying something, Peter is mentioned. When Matthew is doing something, he mentions Matthew. But this gospel writer never reveals his name but instead he writes himself as the disciple who Jesus loved. That must've been so irritating to read. <laughs> Jesus loves us all, but he loves me most. Uh, if you have your Bible with you, we're gonna go into John chapter 20, the first 10 verses or so, or you have the Bible app or whatever. John chapter 20, I'm gonna be reading from the ESV for those who care? Picking up in verse one, and you will see it on the screen. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, 
Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. They really believed, pause for a second, they really believed that someone had stolen the body of Jesus because no one believed he would actually rise from the dead. Not the ones who knew him best, not the ones who loved him most, not the ones who placed their hope in him, actually believed he would rise from the dead. And so when people attempt to undermine the resurrection and say it was all a giant conspiracy, it's fabricated, it was a lie that they began to tell. They couldn't even imagine this lie because they couldn't even imagine that it should be real. These people were so incredulous. No one would ever believe this. They didn't even believe it for themselves. And yet it was true. So instead of believing he rose from the dead, and instead of believing all the times he said, I'm going to rise again, instead of doing that, Mary here chose to believe his body was stolen. She cries out, we don't even know where they put him. It's because no one put him anywhere. Verse 3, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb, and both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love John's humility. Yes, he remains nameless, but he's going to tell you who won that race. And you know, they say everything is recorded in the Bible for a reason, and John definitely made sure. They're going to remember this for thousands of years. We both ran to the tomb. We heard crazy news. Not a big deal. I did get there first. Verse 5. Uh, he, John, uh, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. And that is something that I love about Peter because he just does what comes to mind. He thinks it, he does it. No, he just does it. He doesn't even think most of the time. He just does it. When, when uh, he's across the river, he, sorry, he's across the water, he just does what comes to mind. And he says, he sees Jesus walking on the water. And he says, Lord, tell me and I will walk on the water. And Jesus says, okay, come on. Uh, when the Roman soldiers come and arrest Jesus, Peter takes out his sword who, by the way, is a fisherman? Why do you have a sword, bro? Whatever. They grab Jesus, and Peter is ready to fight. He cuts off the ear of a soldier. You can almost see Jesus picking up the ear, rolling his eyes at Peter. Not thinking, are you, Peter? Just acting, right, Peter? See, Peter is usually wrong when he does these sorts of things, but not this time. See, Peter, as I read Peter, Peter is a man of passion, of great conviction and emotion. He doesn't hesitate. And while John, we are all familiar with, got there first, John stops at the entrance and Peter goes straight in. Continuing, it says, he saw the strips of linen lying there, verse seven, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went inside. I love this visual and how seeing Peter's courage prompted John to faith. Because verse 8 finishes, he, this is John, he saw and believed. And you know, that's the thing about faith is that you believe even when you don't understand. Verse nine, they didn't understand. <laughs> what a juxtaposition. He saw and believed he did not understand. Because from the scripture, Jesus had to rise from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So how many of us have done what John 
initially does here. To come so close to the empty tomb, to the power of the resurrection, but we don't go in. We stand on the outside of faith. We look in, but we haven't crossed that line for ourselves where the resurrection of Jesus changes our lives forever. I want you to know today that if you believe, but your life isn't transformed, there's a step you need to take. A step into the tomb where the miraculous takes place. As it says in verse nine, you may not understand it all, but we're not asked to understand it all. We're not asked to come up with every single answer that comes up regarding faith. It's about taking the step of faith into the tomb. And sometimes we just simply have to say, I don't understand it all. I don't get it all. I, 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 I struggle with this. I don't understand, but I believe. Answers are fine, but faith will change your life. Now, now John, he did not write this down in the moment. He wasn't journaling on the way to the tomb. In case you don't know, John, this was a considerable amount of time later, he wrote this entire thing down later, looking back, knowing what he knows now that he didn't know then. And I think there's a lot of power in hindsight that we don't have in the present, that we don't have in foresight. You know, hindsight, you're reflecting on something from the past, can really reveal a lot of truth and meaning we can otherwise miss in the moment. Think about your own life for a second. Have you ever looked back at things with hindsight that, that just stir all sorts of emotion inside of you? It was just so beautiful and impactful and incredible. But in the moment, it was, woe is me, this is the worst moment of my life. I have, I have three incredible children. What a great segue, right? Worst moment of my life. Hey, I, I have three children. Hey, but they are incredible. And I remember each of their births differently. But the consistent truth was that, honestly, their mama was a boss. I just was there, you know, I was cheering her on, coaching her on, whatever. But if you were to ask me today what I thought of those births, looking back with hindsight, I can look at you and say, man, it was beautiful. It was life-changing. It was almost existential what took place. But what if you had asked me in the moment? What if I had written down my thoughts during labor and you got to read those words? Are those the same words that I would use. It's beautiful. It's life-changing. It's incredible. Would I just be gushing about the meaning of life? No. And in case you're wondering, you don't have to wonder because during the birth of our first son, I live tweeted the entire 12 hour event and I posted in real time online the entire thing. Any thought that came to mind, I put it out there. Any feeling I had, I put it out there. That's a dangerous thing, right? But I did it. And I stand here today with hindsight, remembering that birth. It was life-changing. It was beautiful. But if you're wondering maybe some of my thoughts, I got a couple for you right now. Uh, go ahead and throw the first one up there. Um, just, I, I, I live tweeted the whole thing. There's a lot of them. But the first one is me asking my wife, do you want me to live tweet this? And she said, I want a milkshake. That's all I've ever wanted. Or the next one, uh, I tweeted, does Taco Bell deliver? What if it's an emergency? Asking for a friend. And just so you know, this is 2014. This is an ancient amount of time ago, apparently. No DoorDash, no Uber Eats. So this joke is already out of date. Go ahead to the next one. Uh, I also tweeted, if contractions could be seen in text, I think they would look like this. I think there's one more. Is there one more? There's one more. Oh, happy Easter. My last ditch effort to talk Kelsey into naming our son Peyton Manning Earnhardt isn't going nearly as well as you would think. I fully know how ridiculous and stupid that is. You can laugh, okay? But the point is, is in the moment, I did not appreciate the magnitude of the situation. And it's not that, and it's not until I have some distance that honestly, I get a more accurate picture of that day. In hindsight, it changed my life. It was absolutely incredible. It drew me closer to my bride 
I stand here today in awe of the miracle of life. And as I look back, as if you don't yet, you will soon. You cringe at your old stuff, your old posts, just a little bit. But I still rejoice in that season of life. Because hindsight is a powerful tool that when we think back to important conversations we had, impactful events in our lives, we can see them for what they truly are. Sure, I thought it was funny to post any thought that came to mind in the moment. But as time goes by, I get a more accurate picture of what really took place in my heart, in my family, and in my marriage, in my life. Hindsight, I'm telling you, hindsight really brings forth understanding. And I promise there's a point to this. Because it's with hindsight that John writes this story for us. What would this event have looked like if John wrote it down in the moment? I think John, he may be a fellow Enneagram 3 like me. I think if he had Twitter, this is, this is, what, it would, this is what it would be. Um, uh, Mary said someone stole Jesus' body, so I raced Peter to see. I beat Peter. Peter was very slow. I am very fast. I beat Peter there by at least 30 cubits. Hashtag running, hashtag fit fam. Okay, that's stupid. That's stupid. Happy Easter. But don't lose what I'm saying. Had the story been recorded in the moments, this is what I'm saying, we would have missed so much of what really happened. You think John was already bragging too much in hindsight? Imagine what he would have done in the moment. Do you understand that if you never look back on events in your life and see them for what they truly are, you could be missing what really took place. In your life, maybe something absolutely tragic happened and you walk around wounded today, refusing to reflect on what happened, so healing never comes. When you look back with hindsight, I think we get a more accurate picture, not less. Look what else John wrote. John 13, going back a few chapters, verse one. Again, with hindsight, John's writing this, and he's remembering this Passover festival, and he pulls from it the greatest truths. He says, he wrote down, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. That's beautiful. And really, it is a poetic way of saying, Jesus knew it was time for him to die. And as he had done what was necessary to that point, he loved them. John writes of this love that goes through to the end. And remember, John didn't sit at this table at the Passover and jot these thoughts down immediately. But he's looking back. And in doing so, he wants us to know that even through Jesus' brutal death, through Jesus' pain and his literal torture, that Jesus loved them to the end. And Jesus knew they did not love him until the end. Remember, most scattered, most denied. They left him and betrayed him. But it's still an interesting statement, isn't it? Look, out, look at that last sentence. He loved them to the end. Because the end of love is endless. He loved them to the end. But the end was actually just the beginning. He loved them to the end. What they didn't know was that the story wasn't finished, but it had just gotten started. You see, if Jesus' story ended on the cross, then yes, he truly did love them to the end. But he rose from the dead so that love conquered death because love is more powerful than death. Love is eternal. Are you with me this morning, church? Are you with me? And so someone today just needs to hear that Jesus loves you to the end, but his love even goes beyond that. When, when you are at the end of yourself, Jesus' love for you continues. When you are so sick of your mistakes and your choices, Jesus' love for you continues. Jesus, Jesus loves you to the end so you can have a new beginning. That is the gospel message. That is the gospel truth, that Jesus loves you to the end so you can have a new beginning. Uh, John, he writes about this love elsewhere in 1 John. Picking up in chapter 4, uh, John, he writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 
Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. That everything that comes from God comes as an expression of that love. The entire universe is a material reflection of God's love for you. The cosmos, the stars, the planets, the moons, the comets, the mountains, the beaches, carbon concentrations, oxygen levels, the very atmosphere that we live in is perfect for sustaining human life. It is an absolute declaration of God's love for you. No matter what you've heard about God, his singular motivation for you is love. It is love. We are surrounded by it. And yet we are all looking for it. Love, belonging, significance, meaning. It's not found in another buzz or another high or another stranger's bed. Love is found in the author. God is love. And John, he makes it so simple. He writes in hindsight of it all. Verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Not that we might suffer and struggle, but live. Not that we might be condemned, but live. Not that we might have all the answers, but that we may live. I heard a pastor talk about it this week. He said, this verse, this single verse is the language of God. Meaning, regardless of what life has thrown at you, we all have deep questions on our hearts. And it's usually something to the effect of, God, what are you saying to me? Or maybe you hear people who don't have a faith background, and they say, universe, what are you saying to me? Have you ever heard that? It's, it's the same motive. They are just simply wanting meaning and significance and belonging and truth. They call it universe. I call it God. But we all are asking the same question, what do you want with my life? You're here today whether you have faith or no faith, and you are wondering, what do you want with my life? Is there anything beyond the material? What are you saying to me? God is saying, live. Live. That you would live. Live how? Through Jesus. But what's that look like? It looks like love. It looks like love. And that is the message of Easter, that love won and death lost The question is, am I waiting outside the tomb, looking in, waiting for someone else to do it for me? Or am I going to take the step of faith for myself? Because reaching the tomb isn't enough. Are you going to take the step inside the tomb? Because while you may be close, you are still just looking in. You are still holding back. But here's something I think may help. Is that John, he would later write again in in, in 1 John, John, 1 John 3, 14, He writes, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Isn't that just beautiful? Because we love each other. What if Christians were known for that instead of, well, everything else? Because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Now, okay, that's a troubling statement immediately, right? What does that even mean? To deny love is to die? To deny love is to remain in death. I'm dead. See, when we are only looking in at this tomb, so to speak, when we are not all in, when we like Jesus, but we don't really love Jesus, when we are lukewarm toward our faith, we might as well be dead because we've never truly experienced love We've never truly experienced love, so we remain in death. It would be like attempting to live without oxygen. How long would you make it? A couple of minutes, max, right? You might as well be dead because you're not going to make it. And so in life, love is much the same. We can reach for love. We can grasp at love. We can, we can maybe even sense love when we feel loved. We can show up to church and maybe feel some love. We can try to even live like Jesus and love each other. But until you choose to step into the tomb, until you decide for yourself that Jesus is Lord, you are trying to live without oxygen. You are trying to live without love. You remain in death. And so John, this nameless disciple, he stepped into the tomb and he found faith. 
He found forgiveness. He found grace. He found mercy. He found the miraculous. But someone else had to go in ahead of him. John, again, the one who wrote all the words we've been reading today. I don't know how familiar you are with his life. So let me just tell you. Uh, He actually lived a long life. And he was the only disciple who did. All the other disciples, all of John's friends, they were all captured, imprisoned, and beaten, and ultimately murdered. What would drive someone to do that? What would drive so many people to do that? It was love. These friends of John, they all refused to recant their allegiance to Jesus, that Jesus is Lord. They refused to deny that Jesus rose from the dead because Jesus changed their lives forever. So John saw one by one as they were set on fire, they were cut in two, they were beheaded. And yet the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. But for John, he was never murdered. And he lived this long life. This long life, but this lonely life as he was exiled onto an island called Patmos. And he grew old watching the ones he loved live for love and die for love and declare it's all for love. If you wouldn't mind to please, please stand as, as, as we are coming to, to the end, um, but please do so quietly because love is here among us and with us and upon us. John later writes something very strange in the book of Revelation. John, he's, now get this, get this, get this as as we wrap up. John is not looking back. This, This whole time we've been looking at John and reading John and saying, John's been looking back. Well, in the Revelation, he's not looking back. But where's he looking? He's looking forward and he writes something kind of strange. He writes something kind of bizarre. And so in Revelation 21, one, you should see this on the screen. John writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. See, scholars have debated what could John possibly mean here? A new heaven and a new earth, sure but no seas? I don't think it's all that complicated. See, I don't think John is implying there would be no literal bodies of water in heaven, but for John, for him, exiled on this island, completely alone and isolated, wishing he wasn't. I think John is saying there will no longer be a divide. And I think there are are folks here today, we feel like there is a divide. There is something missing. our, Our souls long for real love. And John captures that here. There is a divide. And he says, there will no longer be a divide. I mean, put yourself in John's place for just a moment. You would look out every single day and see nothing but the sea. And and the sea became a symbol of division that kept John from everyone he loved. And every day of his life, John felt that disconnect. Every day of his life, John felt that loneliness. And every day of his life, John felt that distance. And the sea became the constant reminder to him that things were not as they should be yet. This Jesus that casts out all fear, this, this Jesus that moved me from death to life. This Jesus has shown me the end of love is actually endless. This Jesus that is the purest expression of love was and is real and we celebrate that. This Jesus, the divine embodiment of love was real. And what did we do when this love came to earth? We murdered him. through our rebellion, through our pride, through hubris and sin, we killed him. And yet Jesus did the most bizarre thing. 
he accepted. We ultimately rejected Jesus. And Jesus accepted the death sentence for you. Yeah, you and your messed up history and your dysfunctional life and all of your mistakes. He saw it and he said it's worth it because a true relationship with God is possible through love, through Jesus. But church, listen, listen, listen. There is a divide. We are divided by sin. We have been exiled into an island of our own making. But Easter is the reminder of what could be brought back together. What we separated, what you and I separated, God still made a way. God made a bridge back to us. And Jesus, he takes it all on his literal shoulders and he bears the brunt of the punishment I deserve. Why would he do that? Because God is love. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. Church, do you hear that? If you hear nothing else, it's because he loves you. It is because he loves you. What we separated, God made a way. And I don't care what you've heard of God or religion or truth before, hear this. God is love and Jesus ends any division between you and love. And that is it. Will you take hold of this love? Will you today take a step into that tomb for yourself? Will you take a step toward God today? Because God is love and he loves you and cares for you. But you have a decision to make looking in that tomb. And maybe you see other people who just, it, it comes so naturally to them. That's great for them, right? That's great for them. I'm not like that. It doesn't come naturally to me. I struggle. I would be John because I'm fast, but also because I struggle. Because I struggle. And I don't know what your experience with church is, but at our church, you can struggle. You can have a, a hard time. You can mess up because I'm messed up. We, we are all just messed up people trying to point you to a perfect savior in Christ. We're not here to judge and throw stones at you, but instead to help elevate you, to see Christ in your life. You don't have to understand it all. Uh, Lord knows I don't, but it's just that step of faith. I have questions, I have concerns. I'm wrestling with this. I'm struggling with this. It's okay. You're in good company. I want to invite our prayer ministers forward. If, if this is something where you, you would love to just talk with someone, you would love to pray with someone. We have some incredible people who would love to pray with you. I would love to pray with you. Whatever is on your heart. But just understand that Easter is the pronouncement that God didn't forget you that God didn't ditch you. And in your darkest moment, he's at work. Because remember, in the very first verse we read, Mary goes to the tomb in the what? In the dark. The miracle took place in the dark. Whatever darkness you are facing, God is at work. Miracles happen in the dark. Will you pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, we come before you and, and, and maybe we just still have a lot of questions. We, we, we still have a lot of things on our mind and, and we're struggling to understand. Uh, God, you haven't called us to full understanding, but to just take a step. And so I pray today, as, as for some of us, maybe we feel distant. Maybe we feel like we need to take a step. Maybe we feel out of sync, or we had a bad experience in church, we had a bad experience with religion, we just had something that wasn't love given to us, and, and it was labeled God. God, I pray against those things. I pray 
for a very real sense of your love right now. And maybe we haven't felt it in years. A very real sense of who you are and your love for us. Move in this place. Compel us to move forward. Compel us to take a step, to, to come for prayer, to sit down and kneel for prayer, to, to take a step toward you, Father. That love is here. That love is moving in this place. That grace is on our hearts this morning. It is in front of us. All we have to do is embrace it. We don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to have our lives together before we come as we are. And that is the beauty of the love of God. What looks like the end is a new beginning. And this love is endless. Father, I pray that truth would wash over our, our souls today, our souls this morning. That you are love. And that you are here. In Jesus' name, amen.